welcome uh, to the third and last you know, part of our 12 series, Dharma Talk. And uh, today we will deal with Zen. Zen is a huge subject. And Zen as a word is becoming such a commonplace that now they even named an MP3 player Zen. What does that mean to us Zen practitioners or people who are interested in tradition? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. They can name many things, Zen, many people, Zen teachers and Zen masters, yet it does not alter anything for us. Why? Originally, the Buddha did not teach with scriptures primarily. He was teaching with his practice, with together action, and he answered the questions of his disciples. That's why in the sutras, if you read them, you see that the first line always says, Thus I have heard. And then, as the sutras continue, you will see that the Buddha talks to his disciples, Subhuti, or Shariputra, or Agivesana. There's always somebody who asks a question, and then the Buddha answers. We have considered many, many of his teachings in the previous eight chapters, and now we get down to what we call Zen Buddhism. How can we date the start of Zen? In fact, people say that Zen started even before the Buddha's time. The Buddha often refers to Buddhas before him, like Deepamkara Buddha, Kashyapa Buddha, etc. How many Buddhas were there before him in the past is also none of our concern. What is really important that in his lifetime, he displayed the teaching beyond words and speech three times. And that is marked as the historical start of Zen for our historical era. What was the first? Everybody knows the story when Buddha sat on Vulture Peak, not moving. 1,200 people were waiting for the Dharma talk to begin, And yet the Buddha did not speak and did not move. After quite some time of waiting, the Buddha held up a flower. Nobody understood what that meant. Only Mahakashyapa smiled. And this big smile meant that he understood. So then the Buddha spoke. I'm in possession of the most precious precious teaching, formless form, nameless name, which I transmit now to Mahakashyapa. Thus, Mahakashyapa became the first patriarch. What was transmitted? If you know, already a mistake. If you don't know, also a mistake. That's where Zen begins. Okay? The second of such occasions was when Buddha shared his cushion with Mahakashyapa. This is a very interesting point because just like now, Buddhism is very hierarchical. Older monks sit before younger monks. Monastics sit before lay people. That's how it has always been. And if the tradition continues, that's how it will be. One day... The Buddha was on his seat again before some teaching occasion. Mahakashyapa was a little late. He was a young monk, although his body age was more advanced. And then, as he came in, he was expected to sit down at the back of the rows, as a young monk should. But he did not. He goes straight up to the Buddha, and people sense that there's something extraordinary How come that this young monk can come forward and yet he does not sit down anywhere? And the Buddha just moves a little bit and then offers a seat right next to him. This was unprecedented. What does that really mean? That means that our Buddha nature is equal. Our potential to attain enlightenment is equal. If we practice hard, we can attain the same as the Buddha did. No difference whatsoever. 
Okay? This is a very, very important point. And then, the third occasion was after the Buddha's passing. His triple coffin was prepared, but Mahakashyapa was again in the countryside teaching, so he could not attend the better part of the funeral. So, three days passed, and then Mahakashyapa arrives. He walks around the coffin three times, bows to it three times, and then hits with his stick three times. One, two, three. And as the third hit passed, the Buddha's bare feet, boom, they appear through the coffin's walls. Everybody was shocked, surprised. Okay? What does that really mean? This was not some miracle, okay? Although people can talk about it as miraculous. What this really means is that the body dies, but your mind never dies. Okay? What's really important is to perceive what is permanent, and thereby attaining something which is beyond permanence or impermanence. Okay? So, historically, the Buddha taught many, 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 many scriptures. We say 84,000 scriptures to fix 84,000 kinds of thinking, to bring them to the middle way and to bring them to extinction. And a typical Zen question is, if you do not have the 84,000 kinds of mind, what use is there for the 84,000 dharmas? This is the beginning of Zen. This is where we jump 28 generations when Bodhidharma, the 28th patriarch, after the Buddha, transmitted the Buddha's mind seal to China. This was a very, very important event. When Bodhidharma arrived, then they said in China, so far we've had only the baggage. Now we have the owner. So Buddhism has been trickling into China from, I would say, the first or the second century AD, continuously. If you are familiar a little bit with Chinese Buddhism, you know the White Horse Temple. The White Horse Temple is where a white horse carrying the sutras died, and they built a temple around it. It's a sutra temple to the present day, and it functions. So, Buddhism went to China, but the great master, which was carrying the Buddha's mind seal, was Bodhidharma. And they knew that he was coming. So, Emperor Wu of Liang, he was quite well prepared. He had his uh, own court monk, who was teaching him on a daily basis, in Korean, is Kuksa, the national teacher. Okay? So he was there and he was teaching Emperor Wu on a daily basis, what is Buddhism? How do we serve the country? Because for time immemorial in China, ever since civilization you know, dawned and they could put an end to the internal strife, Confucianism, Taoism, and later Buddhism, they all played a part in shaping China's culture and later... Of course, Korea's culture, Japan's culture, anywhere they went in Asia. So Emperor Wu was quite well prepared inside, and he was waiting. So the great teacher, Bodhidharma, comes, and then Emperor Wu asks a few questions. And the first question went like this. In my life, I have built many temples, fed countless of monks and nuns, gave innumerable donations. How much merit did I gain? Then, as many of you know, Bodhidharma says, no merit. Then, Emperor Wu was shocked, because the Lotus Sutra clearly says, if you donate clothing, you get this merit. If you donate food, you get this merit. If you build temples, even bigger merit. If you build stupas, even bigger merit. So he was re, you know, waiting for his big, big pat on the shoulder. And Bodhidharma says, no merit. So that was very strong. So after the shock, he asked the second question. Then what is the meaning of the Holy Scriptures? Rightfully so. You know, logically, just what's the meaning if there's no merit? Then Bodhidharma says, 
No holiness, only clear, vast, empty space. Well, that almost totally erased the mind of Emperor Wu. But there was one little question still lingering. He says, then who is right in front of me? Again, logic worked because he says, if it's only vast empty space, then who is right in front of me? Then Bodhidharma just, the last hit, don't know. Literally, no mind or no thinking, Wu Shun. Okay? So then, Emperor Wu gets really upset and says, I find nothing common between us. Then he goes. Then Bodhidharma crossed the river Yangtze and then goes up to Shaolin, sits for nine years, and then after that he starts teaching. So this is a supremely important point because the continuous line of Zen teachers started really with Bodhidharma. So we date back the teaching to the Buddha, the three occasions of wordless, mind-to-mind -mind teaching. But the real person who started it, and for six generations had a continuous monolithic line to the sixth patriarch, was Bodhidharma. He's not so well documented or mentioned. If you look around, there's one book about him where they quote four of his, they say, sermons or Dharma talks. They are pretty strong, very much to the point. So if you read them, there's no mistake about them, okay? But not much else. Without him, we would not be talking about Zen. We would not be practicing the meditation school of Buddhism, which is a big contradiction in term. Why? As I said, originally Buddha taught practicing, together action of the Sangha, that's how the precepts came, and he was answering the students' questions. Okay? So why talk about the jhana school of Buddhism, which is the meditation school? Because later the sutras and learning became stronger than practicing. In certain traditions, they are still the same as before. So learning, reciting the sutras, memorizing the Buddha's words are still more important than practicing and attaining the Buddha's mind. And Bodhidharma, with the four principles of Zen, turns these priorities back to the supposed original order, which is, do not depend on the scriptures, pointing directly to human mind, attain your true self, become Buddha, and give transmission outside the scriptures, independent of the sutras. Okay? So sometimes you read this in a different order, saying, not depending on the scriptures, transmission from mind to mind, directly point to human nature, attain your true self, become Buddha. But there is a methodological error here. So mind to mind transmission comes second, but what is there to transmit? Just not depending on the scriptures? No, that's not enough. So first, do not depend on the scriptures. Then, if you don't depend on the scriptures, you can directly point to human mind. Then if you practice, you become Buddha, and then you transmit that independent of any scriptural or methodological teaching, mind to mind. That's the end point. Okay? Or the beginning of the new circle, as you can see in the ten ox herding pictures, how the disciple you know, goes on. I'm not going to lay out in detail the Tanakh serving pictures. If you look at the walls of this stage of Kwanjan around, you can see very well what's what. Okay? And as a last piece of introduction to the first uh, talk on Zen, I want to briefly characterize the etymology of Zen because some people are confused what is Zen, Son, Chan, etc. I mentioned that the meditation school in India is called Jhana, Jhana schools. So when it went to China, they began to call it Channa. Then they chopped off the end and became Chan. Then they gave a character to it. Everybody knows that, right? And then this Chan was read as Son in Korea and Zen in Japan. And since Japan exported the term first to the West, that's why everything where you do it like this is known as Zen. So if you say Korean Zen, 
it's actually not correct. You would have to say Korean son or cham son. Then it's correct. But of course, we go with the trend a little bit. And as I said right at the beginning, it really doesn't matter what you call it. If you do it. If you don't do it, then it remains outside of you. It doesn't become you. Okay? So, so much about the first historical introduction, uh, spiced with some anecdotes. And if you have any questions on that, please ask. Uh, Sunim, I would like to ask you about having relations and ending the relationships. relationships. Uh, it is about something that you said last week. You said, uh, well, I wrote down, uh, not to forget, um, Uh, You keep meeting the people because you haven't finished the karma with them Mm -hmm. before. What is finishing a karma with somebody? Does it mean uh, staying married or staying in a relationship with uh, people until, quote unquote, the death do them apart? Or what about those people? who stop having relationships uh, with others. As long as you're a human being in this body, you have relationship, okay? Even if you're a hermit in the mountain, you have relationship. Because your body may be separate from another group of humans, but your mind's always connected. So it's an illusion to confine your consciousness to your brain. It's a mistake, okay? We share the same human consciousness, okay? This is a very basic thing, but everybody must understand that, okay? This original true self has no name, no form, no appearance, no disappearance, but if I want to use a metaphor, we all use it like breathing air, okay? So the air I breathe and the air you breathe and the air everybody breathes is the same air, but we have our own noses, hmm? our own lungs. So that's how it works. So finishing your relationship means that both of you have nothing left to do with one another. Now if that takes a divorce, fine. But usually, or many times, after divorce, the relationship comes, becomes even better and they start dating again because they really haven't finished. Okay, It's not just in movies, it's in everyday life too. So, this kind of form of marriage, or being divorced, or being kind of, what do they call this? Domestic partnership, these forms do not matter. The connection or the relationship of bodies, speech energies, and minds, that's what matters. Okay? When the forces that are relating the two individuals or more to each other, completely stop, then the relationship also stops. If not, you keep meeting. Maybe not the same person, but a person with analog karma, similar karma, because you haven't finished, okay? So we used to joke around, you know, in monastic circles, if you have the same vibes, you get the same guys. So it's like a nursery rhyme, but it has some truth in it. If you have a certain mindset, you attract certain people who have the opposite mindset because opposites attract each other. Not just in physics, in human relationship also. So if you have opposites mind, you will always find somebody who hits that because they have just the the diametric opposite, you know? And if you look at it this way, then you have to practice a mind which is beyond opposites to finish all kinds of opposite relationship, okay? Now the question might arise, what happens if you finish all opposite relationship? Then comes bodhisattva relationship. Unconditional, okay? Not expecting really anything. And then you are joining one another to help this world. So the energy of the two or more individuals is not just for themselves. It's opening up to help this world. That's what we call bodhisattva relationship. I have seen Buddhist marriages being transformed into bodhisattva relationship. They had their kids, they had their jobs, they had their 
own personal karma with each other, but it was totally refined by the clarity and compassion of their practicing into helping other people. Okay? So don't ask me how to end a relationship. As long as you're human, it never ends. But what's really important is how to improve the quality of the relationship. That's by practicing. If you practice a mind which is no attachment, no wanting, no holding, no checking, okay? Then all these, we say, defilements or bad karma is removed. And then your mind is very clear, spontaneous, flexible, open, compassionate, has some wisdom, has some energy. So this is a quality to achieve. Now, if your relationship is so bad that it almost kills you, then you should thank that person for it, because it's a very strong teaching. Either you are strong enough to take it or not. If you're strong enough to take it, you work with it and see what is there to reconcile. Why do I get such a strong teaching from somebody? Okay? If you're not strong enough, leave. Because if you break, that's no use. Or if you die, this body dies, also no use. Okay? So only by practicing and transcending opposites, that's the way to refine any relationship, not just relationships, your life situation, also your life function. Okay? Another joke which we used to share, you know, with our practicing folks. From this planet, there's really nowhere to go. Okay? Why? We have a job here. We wanted to be born here. So that's why we are here. Otherwise, we would not be here. So find your real job. Find your real relationship. And without seeing our true situation on this planet, we cannot do that. What prevents us from seeing our true situation? All kinds of beliefs, ideas, and escape tactics. Okay? So don't try to escape. Don't delude yourself. Do not presuppose any identity. Get straight to the point. What's my situation? What's my desired function? And then the relationship also becomes very clear. Okay? Very good. Thank you for your wonderful question. This is the end of our first session on Zen. This program is the most important part of the Zen 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 Z